Hello and welcome to a program, Neuropsychoanalysis, where brain meets mind. We're going to spend the next 30 minutes speaking with Professor Mark Solms from the University of Cape Town, Departments of Neurology and Psychology, about neuropsychoanalysis, what it is and how it can help us to study the human mind. Hello, Professor Solms. Hello, Professor Yuval. So the first question that I would like to, to ask you is, I, the question that I would assume everyone looking at this program would ask themselves, what is neuropsychoanalysis? How would you define it? Um, well, it's pretty much what the name sounds like. It's an, it's an attempt to integrate uh, the neurosciences with psychoanalysis um, based on the assumption that fundamentally they're studying the same thing. Psychoanalysis studies the human mind, tries to understand what the underlying principles are that govern its behavior. And neuroscience, especially in recent decades, has increasingly been studying that too, trying to understand the, the human mind from the point of view of brain science. And uh, it goes without saying that, therefore, these two disciplines should be talking to each other. And neuropsychoanalysis is a sort of formalized attempt to get them to do that. Very good. Um, a as you know, we're having this discussion on an academic channel, and I think our, our viewers are probably well aware that neurosciences have always been on the forefront of, of um, um, academic endeavor, whereas psychoanalysis really has not. So I think it, they might find it strange that psychoanalysis is finding its way back into the academic and research world, because for most of the 20th century, psychoanalysis and the neurosciences have followed two very different courses. Could you perhaps elaborate on why these two things are coming together now and what do you hope to get out of the confluence of these two separate disciplines? Um, well, if I can first of all address the point as to why psychoanalysis has never been uh, a part of academic science. Um, I think it has everything to do with the perspective, the observational perspective that psychoanalysis has taken on the mind. That perspective is the one of subjective experience. Psychoanalysts study the mind first and foremost from the point of view of what it's like, what it is to be a human mind, and what can we learn about the structure and function of the mind from the point of view of human beings experiencing a lived life. Now, uh, you might think if you have a science of the mind that that would be a perfectly legitimate, indeed probably the first obvious place to look uh, to study the mind. But um, unfortunately, it carries with it all sorts of difficulties. Experience is a fleeting, fugitive stuff. It's very difficult to pin down. It's almost impossible to study experimentally, uh, to measure in any meaningful way, to replicate in any meaningful way, to control in any meaningful way. The real stuff of a lived life is next to impossible. So although I think it's very much to the credit of psychoanalysis that it tried to study this thing, the experiencing mind, uh, nevertheless it came at the price of uh, um, not meeting the canons of science and therefore never being fully accepted in the uh, universities, at least not in the scientific faculties of the universities. Now, um, the question you then ask is, why, uh, at this point, uh, are the two fields coming together? Um, I think that a, a historical perspective is, is probably a good one. You know, we, we should ask, uh, why did psychoanalysis arise in the first place at the time that it did? Sigmund Freud, I don't know how many people know this, Sigmund Freud was a neuroscientist. He was a very serious neuroscientist, uh, studied um, from the 1870s onwards, uh, basic neuroscientific topics, published an enormous amount uh, of research in uh, all manner of neurosciences over a period of 20 years. Um, and it was only as he moved to the more complex topics, you know, starting with cell biology, um, uh, through uh, uh, trying to uh, map out uh, uh, neural networks, through to the complex functional questions, especially as applied to mental functions. How does the brain produce language? And more than that, how does the brain regulate the sorts of things that he was seeing clinically uh, when working with neurotic uh, patients? How, uh, what's going on in the brain when one is dealing with a traumatic event? Uh, what is it that makes us uh, uh, struggle uh, with uh, 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 traumatic events, for example? 
Um, and uh, there Freud had to face the fact very reluctantly that the neuroscience of his day, in other words, the discipline within which he was trained, was unable to study those things. Could, could you say something about how he came to realize that? Well, um, the main way was uh, actually trying to do it. Right. Um, right. He tried to sketch a neural model uh, known to us as the Project for a Scientific Psychology, trying to sketch a model of what the brain mechanisms must be underlying the um, dynamic complex mental phenomena that he was uh, uh, learning right, about clinically. Right. What, what he calls uh, psychology for neurologists. He, that right. was another term, yeah. uh, another name that was given to that, to that uh, manuscript, which he never published. Mm -hmm. The reason he never published it was because he realized in the process of doing it that it wasn't science. He actually said to his friend uh, Wilhelm Vlies in a letter, the method that I've been using is imaginings, transpositions, and guesses. And for anybody educated in, the, in a, a, a physical science, a biological science, that's not a method at all. So he realized the only way that he could study at that point in time, the only way he could study the real complex stuff of the mind was to abandon neuroscientific methods for the present. It was a tactical, uh, uh, a tactical measure, which he explicitly stated was, this is something we have to do now. For now, we have to abandon the desire to study the complexities of the mind neuroscientifically, and we are forced to study it psychologically. And so he developed the psychoanalytical method as the best um, approach available. Far from perfect, far from ideal, he was painfully aware of all of its shortcomings as, a, as an experimental method. Um, uh, but at least it was an empirical method. At least you could actually study the stuff of the mind directly. You could study feelings. You could study uh, uh, the sequences of life events. You could directly interact with the human subject right. rather than just guessing from the, the, the little bit that was known. Right. A key concept in, in psychoanalytic theory has been the existence of the unconscious. Mm -hmm. And as, as uh, of course we know, uh, this has come under, under intense scrutiny by neurosciences in, in, in the first half of the 20th century. And actually the name be, um, uh, behavioral psychology uh, implies that there is no such thing as, as the unconscious. Could you perhaps elaborate on what, um, were, what were the phenomena that, that made Freud hypothesize the existence of an unconscious part of the mind? And what were the, the, how was the evolution of that concept throughout the history of psychoanalysis? And where did it come to confluence with what uh, neuroscience was looking into at the last part of the 20th century and the early part of this century? Yeah. Well, um, I'm glad that you asked me that, that question because I realize I haven't yet fully answered your previous question, which is, you know, what has changed? Why is psychoanalysis now being uh, uh, looked at in a different way by, by the uh, uh, neurosciences? So perhaps through this example of the unconscious, I can illustrate that point. You know, Freud had only clinical observations uh, to go by. Um, he was um, uh, made aware from his uh, uh, many careful uh, uh, attempts to uh, understand individual human beings. You know, you must realize this is a lot of data, hundreds of patients um, spending an hour every day, with five times a week, in Freud's case, sometimes six times a week with the same patient, trying to, uh, to sort of um, unpick the different causal sequences that made them into the person who they were, made them into the person with the difficulties that they had. Um, and there were sort of, at, at those early days, fairly crude and fairly simple observations, but nevertheless, they were the foundational ones. Freud observed, to use just an example, of course, this is not the classical case, it's an example to illustrate the general point. Freud observed one particular patient who suffered from an hysterical paralysis. She was bedridden, couldn't move. Um, and uh, I, I'm sorry, just for the sake of, of our viewers who are not familiar with those terms, mm -hmm. could you say something about the difference between a hysterical paralysis and a regular paralysis? Okay. How, how are they different? All right. Well, patients of this kind were referred to doctors like Freud because he was a neurologist. Um, uh, 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 neurologists got patients who had paralyses. Uh, that is to say, a part of the body which no longer moves. Uh, usually with a sudden onset, suddenly a part of the body no longer moves. The left-hand side or the right-hand side, uh, if it's a brain, uh, uh, if the cause is in the brain, or the uh, lower half or the entire body, if the cause is in the spine. Uh, Freud was seeing patients like this as a neurologist. And in some of these cases, there's no neurological explanation. They didn't suffer a stroke 
or a trauma or an infectious uh, illness of their nervous system. There's no structural damage, and yet they have a paralysis. So there's unexplained paralysis. And the, thought, the, the thought at the time, and still today, was that these, the causes were functional. That is to say, the nervous system was functioning abnormally uh, because of something uh, uh, in its constitution or something that had happened to it, rather than something that had happened to it experientially, rather than some structural damage to the, to the actual tissue of the nervous system. So Freud got patients like this. This was one of them. And uh, as he, as he uh, sifted through her life story, so he finds that she was in love with a certain man uh, who uh, ultimately married her sister. And this was uh, very upsetting to her. Uh, and she always harbored resentments and envious feelings toward her sister for having married the man that she secretly was in love with, but she had to keep all these feelings suppressed. This is Victorian times, let's mm -hmm. not forget. And uh, then one day, tragically, her sister dies. And so she has the thought... Uh, thank heavens, now uh, he's free for me. Um, uh, now perhaps at last I shall have the opportunity to marry him or to pursue my love uh, for him. And she then presumably immediately feels guilty. I mean, she's, she's, she's celebrating the fact of her own beloved sister's death. But she doesn't feel guilty consciously. She doesn't remember having that thought. What happens instead is she's struck down by a paralysis which makes her bedridden and unable to live um, a full social, uh, normal life of any kind, makes herself unattractive, presumably in her mind, uh, also to, to men. So she, the symptom uh, happens instead of the feeling. Freud's interpretation was at that point she, she had the feeling of guilt, but she doesn't know she had the feeling of guilt. Instead, she got the symptom. So how does Freud test an hypothesis like that? He says to the patient, I think at this point in the causal sequence, you had this thought even though you don't know you had it. See, that's an unconscious thought, an unconscious feeling, which at that time was an unheard of concept. How can you have a thought or a feeling of which you don't know? You know, many neuroscientists to this day actually doubt that fact. And again, the word cognitive science or cognitive psychology, you know, I think hints that there's an implicit assumption that only what is cognized, only what you're aware of actually exists, which of course runs counter to what psychoanalysis has produced and runs counter to what we now know from a lot of yep. basic studies. Again, if you could perhaps uh, elaborate on that point, because I think it's a very important point for, for most of our viewers who, who might actually not be familiar with the arguments that such a thing does exist, a thought that has not been thought cons consciously. Well, um, this speaks uh, directly to the question of what's changed. Why is psychoanalysis uh, now um, a, a, a meaningful participant in the family of, of neural sciences? It's precisely because neuroscientists, you say uh, nowadays many cognitive scientists still don't believe this. That's true. But happily, they are a rapidly diminishing number right, right. because uh, in cognitive neuroscience, the fact uh, the, of an unconscious mental process, the the evidence for an unconscious mind, both an unconscious a form of thinking and an unconscious form of feeling, is enormous. The evidence is overwhelming. Could you so, please give us an example? Well, um, I'll give you a few examples if I, if I please, have time. Please. Um, some of the earliest observations came from patients with amnesias. That's to say patients uh, with loss of memory. Um, uh, there's... Uh, a famous case uh, uh, called H.M., um, who was a patient who had a seizure disorder, who was uh, operated on in Montreal, um, and a, a part of his brain called the hippocampus was resected, was surgically removed bilaterally on both sides of the brain. Uh, this was uh, 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 in an attempt to cure, as I said, a seizure disorder. No, nobody had ever done this operation before, uh, and therefore H.M. Uh, suffered the tragic uh, uh, consequence for the first time. Uh, uh, it was learned that if you remove the hippocampus bilaterally, you can't lay down any new memories. So if there's this man who's, who's no longer able to, everything that happens to him from minute to minute immediately is wiped out. Every new experience wipes out the previous experience. So he lives constantly in the 1950s, which is when this operation was performed. No new experience is laid down in memory. The re uh, but the, what was observed, uh, quite accidentally, uh, as neuropsychologists tested this patient and learned, uh, in order to learn more about human amnesia, 
uh, because he was a unique case, uh, a celebrated case. So they did all these neuropsychological tests on him. And there are only so many neuropsychological tests. So, you know, many neuropsychologists did the same tests over and over. And then they observed that he was getting better. His performance on the tests was improving. Even though he had no recollection of ever having done this test before, nevertheless, he showed improvements. And then this led to a series of experiments specifically looking at this. And it was found that uh, the patient was learning, the patient was remembering, even though he didn't know that he was learning and he didn't know that he was remembering. Then this was expanded to other studies. A, a leading um, a researcher uh, in New York, Joe Ledoux, uh, showed that this applies even to emotional learning, that it's possible to learn something on the basis of uh, a painful experience uh, without knowing that you've learned the thing. Uh, in future, your behavior will be altered on the basis of that emotional experience, even though you don't know that you've had the experience. And this is exactly the sort of thing that Freud was pointing to. But these scientists uh, who studied um, uh, HM and uh, scientists like uh, Ledoux, who work on the amygdala, a closely related brain structure more involved with emotional learning, they were not trying to prove anything about psychoanalysis. I, I suspect they had no interest in psychoanalysis. But what they showed in an entirely independent line of research was the, an independent discovery of the same thing, which is very gratifying in science when two completely different methods by two completely different schools uh, of, of thought find the same thing, you know you're onto something. So there they found unconscious memory exists, unconscious memory of emotional experiences influences our behavior, even though we don't know it. And then there were many other lines of research, uh, for example, split brain studies where it was possible to project information to the right hemisphere of the brain without the left hemisphere knowing anything about it. And that influenced the way the patient behaved. And then the interviewer asks the patient, asks their left hemisphere, which is the speaking hemisphere, why did you do that? And they come up with some explanation as to why they did what they did, which the experimenter can see is not true because we know that it's on the basis of, of information that was given to the right hemisphere. Like in a ca famous patient of Sperry's, Roger Sperry's, um, he projected pornographic images to a woman's right hemisphere, and she became uncomfortable and embarrassed, sh shuffling about in her seat and blushing and giggling. So Sperry says to her left hemisphere, uh, what's the matter, Mrs. B? And she says, I don't know, Dr. Sperry, but it's surely some machine you've got there. Uh -huh. you know, so she feels embarrassed, but she doesn't know why. So another line of evidence for a person's emotional, in this instance, again, emotional, social behavior being altered, by um, uh, uh, influences which are unconsciously processed to which they have no conscious access. But in in, the, in re very recent years, it's even been shown that people can see things unconsciously. You know, there, uh, there's Larry Weisskranz in Oxford who made famous the phenomenon of blind sight, where visual information, blind, people who blind due to loss of the visual, the conscious visual part of their brains. In other words, they're no longer capable of visual consciousness. They still receive visual information, but they can't make it conscious because that part of the brain is not there. Uh, these patients are able to guess where a visual stimulus is. They, they feel they're just guessing. The vice crown says, where is the stimulus? And they say, don't know, Larry, I'm blind. And he says, well, just guess. And they say, well, okay, there. And that's where it is. So they're seeing unconsciously. So all manner of mental processes, memory, emotion, perception, and a host of others uh, are now unequivocally demonstrated to be able to function uh, unconsciously. In fact, the question nowadays has become more of one of why do we have consciousness at all? It's generally, generally very widely accepted that almost all manner of mental functions can function unconsciously. Uh, now the question has become, what does consciousness add to the mind, right. rather than the idea that consciousness is right. the mind? And actually, you yourself, uh, having you know, a foot in both disciplines, both in, in the neurosciences as a neuropsychologist and in psychoanalysis as a trained psychoanalyst, had something to say about exactly this point. Why do we have consciousness at all? In your book, The Brain and the Inner World, mm -hmm. you went into that issue with some detail. Can you mm -hmm. perhaps summarize what, what you said about this question? Why do we have consciousness at all? Well, I'd, I'd, I'd be delighted to, but first I have to um, uh, uh, in, indulge in a little, little bit of modest behavior, which is to tell you that what I did in that book was to point out to readers that uh, 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 independently today, other neuroscientists, not myself, other neuroscientists have come upon um, uh, uh, um, a view, uh, uh, an answer to this question as to why are we conscious at all, which is strikingly similar to the view that Freud came to 
um, 100 years earlier on the basis of psychological observations. So it's not, uh, it's not my theory. The, my, my contribution was just to point out, uh, look here, chaps, you know, we, yeah. we, again, from two entirely different points of view, are coming to the same conclusion. And that conclusion is that the function of consciousness is first and foremost emotional feeling. It's, uh, we can perceive things uh, uh, unconsciously, we can remember things unconsciously, uh, we can solve problems unconsciously, we can make decisions unconsciously, etc. But we, the, the actual having of a feeling, knowing this feels bad or this feels good, is quintessentially conscious. The, the qualitative, valuative feel is what requires consciousness. Um, and Freud's view was that um, uh, uh, we have instincts and drives coming from our biological constitution, which are important for this, our personal survival and for the survival of our species. And the way that the mind regulates uh, how well it's doing in relation to these biological imperatives, it, it, it's, it, it's perceiving, are my instinctual drives being satisfied or are they being frustrated? And the way that it tells itself how it's doing biologically is through feel, conscious feelings. So feelings, bad feelings, feelings of unpleasure, as Freud called it, are indications that I'm doing badly in terms of my biological imperatives. And feelings of pleasure are the opposite. This feels good. It feels good because it's good for your survival uh, and, for, and for the reproduction of your genes. So, so um, this is a kind of valuative mechanism built in by evolution which uh, enables the subject to know very important information about their current status as an organism. Now, it's that point of view which has been recently arrived at uh, by uh, Tony Damasio in his book, uh, The Feeling of What Happens, and also a very similar point of view by uh, Jak Panksepp in his book, Affective Neuroscience. They formulate, on, again, on the basis of utterly different lines of evidence, they formulate the view that it seems that this is what consciousness is for. That's the primal base purpose of consciousness. Of course, from there it extends. I feel like this about that. You know, and so consciousness, which is primarily an introspective or interoceptive state, so it comes to be spread out onto our external perceptual life and, and onto our cognitive apparatus, which uh, people forget is a rather late addition um, to uh, the mind. Good. Um, you yourself, together with Professor Jörg Panksepp, are, I think, the, the co-presidents of the International Society for Neuropsychoanalysis, which you have established. Could you say a few words about what led you to establish that organization? What do you see as its goals? Um, its, its goals, I think, are primarily, uh, for want of a better word, political. Um, and I think we have to acknowledge science doesn't operate in a vacuum. Absolutely. Uh, it's, people would like to believe that all you have to do is the ex you do the experiments, you publish your findings, and the world changes. But it doesn't. Scientists are people. Uh, scientists form groups. Uh, groups of people are complicated things, and they have competitions with each other, competitions for resources in science. That's funding, um, and so on, and personal power. You know, these sorts of things operate in science as much as they do in everything. So um, rather than rail against that, uh, we, uh, uh, Jak Panksepp and I, ex decided to acknowledge the simple fact that that's how it is, and we engaged with it. And uh, the formation of this society was, first of all, to provide a forum where scientists like ourselves who thought it was important for psychoanalysts and neuroscientists to work together, to speak to each other, to educate each other, to do research together, uh, for the reasons I said at the beginning, because we're studying the same thing, um, that we had to provide a, a structure, a social structure, which allowed us to, to sort of support each other. Uh, then secondly, we also used that, that society as a vehicle for inviting leading authorities who we knew thought like we did. So, so um, uh, I've mentioned some of the names already, uh, but uh, in addition, the people like Vilina Ramachandran and the famous Oliver Sacks and people like that, who we knew, and Eric Kandela I haven't yet mentioned, we knew these are neuroscientists who believe like we do that psychoanalysis and neuroscience should come together. And uh, so we also invited these people to join our society uh, in the form of an, uh, uh, a scientific advisory board and so on, with the important purpose of il uh, uh, allowing younger scientists to see, ah, these authorities, Nobel Prize winners, uh, 
um, you know, my intellectual and scientific heroes, people highly respected in academic circles, they are saying that this is important and that this is kosher to do this, to, to communicate across this previously uh, a taboo um, interface. And uh, so the vehicle of the, the purpose of the society is a support group, which then also became a group which uh, had these important figures attached to it, which allowed us to bring in younger scientists who are the future. These are people who are not trained only in neuroscience or only in psychoanalysis, but who, from the beginning, both. we can we can weave the two different perspectives together. Wonderful. We're, we're actually approaching the end of our program. Um, I would like to uh, ask you about the reason that brought you to Israel. Um, you were invited here together with other prominent neuroscientists uh, for the inauguration of the Institute for the Study of Effective Neuroscience mm -hmm. that's being established here at the University of Haifa mm -hmm. due to the generosity of Mrs. Audrey Gruss from the mm -hmm. Gruss Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, and it has as its mission to try to bring together these two disciplines for the study of depression and other illnesses that have to do with mood, which of course are very prevalent clinical problems in our Western world and are going to be even more so in the near future. In the little time that we have left, could you say something about what would be the unique contribution of neuropsychoanalysis, of this confluence coming together of the two perspectives on the mind, the, the psychoanalytical and the neurobiological ones, to the study of depression? How do, can we try to uh, limit its existence? How can we treat it better? Could, could you say a few words about that for, for the end? Well, um, uh, let me say first of all that it's a wonderful development. This Institute for the Study of Affective Neuroscience, very important, and its focus on depression is very important because I think it provides us with a practical problem that we can bring these different research methods to bear on and demonstrate in the most, um, you know, uh, 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 immediately relevant way uh, how this can change psychiatry because that really is our aim. Our aim is to, is to break down this barrier within psychiatry between those who want only to study the person and the lived life and those who want to study only the brain and, 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 and physical uh, processes. And uh, you, if you look at, I mean I can mention just two facts immediately yeah. about depression. Please. Uh, Please. The one is that uh, we, we, we know that there are genetic factors uh, that predispose one to depression, that make one more vulnerable to depression. But we also know that there are certain life events which predispose one to depression. Uh, early separation traumas, for example, it's well established that these predispose you to depression. So the one thing is life events and the other th thing is you know, neurogenetics. Uh, it's obvious that these things have to be brought together if we're going to have a proper understanding of how the thing works, of what depression actually is. Likewise, in the treatment of depression, we know that there are certain medications which are very effective in the treatment of at least many forms of depression. Uh, this is a chemical form of treatment. It's a brain-based form of treatment. We also know that psychotherapies help depression. Uh, certain depressions respond very well to, to psychotherapy. But uh, what is, uh, again, uh, not uh, controversial is that it's generally recognized that both combined are the best Even form of better. treatment for depression. Precisely. So what, is that, what does that say? It, uh, I think it reflects something about what depression is. Depression is a brain disorder. In other words, it's got something to do with genetic vulnerabilities and, the, uh, and, and their interaction with environmental processes which are, which are uh, um, um, encoded in the brain. But it's also a disorder of the lived life. It's a disorder of feelings, and feelings make a difference. The actual, the actual lived subjective experience of these patients is a central part of what the disorder is and if we leave that out of account we'll never understand it and never be able to cure it. Thank you so much Professor Solms. We're, we're fortunate to have you join us today for this program and I wish you all the best and again thank you for coming to Israel and, and participating in this. Thank Thanks you very much. Thank Pleasure. you.